insofar as this course moves toward a consideration of the modern, American literature is a good place to start, uh, since in the last century, America was very much the site of the new, the modern, the future, and the alarming. Uh, America, we should recall, uh, after 45B, is the product of England and Europe, and so was re regarded uh, as culturally subordinate, subordinate secondary and minor, second-rate in culture as the child of a, of a much stronger and long-standing parent uh, country. And uh, some of you know that America is still regarded that way in Europe by some people. The first settlers of this country, moreover, uh, where to draw on the title of a book by a Stanford professor named Jay Flegelman, the first settlers were prodigals and pilgrims. Uh, people were looking for refuge uh, from bad circumstances in Europe or religious fanatics like the Puritans who were looking for a place where they could worship freely and do experimental religious colonies. And in the south, of course, there were penal colonies and the uh, colonies were full of people who were looking for ways to make a buck. Uh, adventurers and uh, people by, by uh, definition poor. Uh, Joyce writes in one of his short stories of America as the sweepings of other countries. And uh, that's one way in which America has been regarded as the uh, uh, Europe, Europe's underside, uh, the rejects, or the trash, and the sweepings. Uh, and you still hear that attitude sometimes uh, in, uh, in Europe, uh, where Americans are regarded as modern, uh, capable of high-tech wonders, but are morally, socially, and intellectually inferior. Um, by the 20th century, it's quite possible to see America as uh, Europe's underside, its dark side, where everything that Europe rejected. Uh, so in the 19th century, though, America was, America was still regarded as uh, new, largely wild, undeveloped, uh, largely unexplored, chaotic, a landscape of spectacular deserts and forests, uh, but also wastelands uh, slowly being domesticated by steam engines, factories, and cotton gins. It's a landscape of pigs and pigsties and pig iron and of unschooled yokels and hicks and rednecks uh, uh, in, the, in the views of some people having no culture uh, uh, except uh, for poetry written about our great resources, uh, the natural landscape, and of course, the uh, by now romanticized uh, Native American. It's, it's still possible to see the subsidiary uh, uh, status of America, but in two ways. On the negative side, it's uh, possible to see America uh, as a place that's undergone a loss and degradation of European culture, um, a place in which Euro Euro European culture has been devalued. On the positive side, uh, and, and maybe the, the most dominant way of seeing American culture is that it's no culture. It's uh, an experiment in social organization that starts out in pure innocence and, and creates a, 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 a society and culture from scratch. And a corollary to all these considerations is that poetry, uh, through the mid-19th century, the point at which uh, we begin this course, is largely an imitation of uh, superior European models. So those of you who have taken 45B, uh, will have, if you've read poetry at all, will have encountered two dominant m modes of poetry. There's uh, the heroic couplet, uh, rhyme, rhyme, rhyme verse, uh, which dominated the poetry of the Enlightenment, and then a romantic blank verse, uh, uh, and ballad, ballad kind of writing, which has picked up an imitation of English nature poets. Uh, Whitman and Dickinson, uh, who grow out of the romantics, uh, are bent on producing, in different ways, a distinct American voice, uh, new voices that are modern. Um, and Whitman, uh, as I mentioned last time, is the inventor of free verse, uh, verse without restraints, uh, which is, uh, uh, in ways we're going to uh, see, uh, uh, something uniquely American. Uh, and since invention and freedom have been two of our preeminently celebrated cultural practices, it's possible to see uh, uh, Emer uh, uh, Whitman as both uh, an inventor and as the originator of this free verse form, inventors are among our heroes. Uh, think of Eli Whitney or Robert Fulton, after whom Fulton Street is named, or Thomas Edison or Henry Ford, or even Steve Jobs, who brings us this wonderful little iPod, on which I have a recording of Walt Whitman uh, reading uh, on, on a wax cylinder that was recorded by another inventor, Thomas Edison. So uh, I hope this works. Uh, Oh, I'm giving you Ezra Pound instead. Let's start out with a, a virtual beverage, uh, if I can get this thing to work.
the enduring infinite years. Perennial with the earth, with freedom, love, and love. Okay, uh, you could tell he's from New York. I don't know if you, you picked up the Long Island accent. He says ample instead of ample, but he comes from Long, Long Island, and this is recorded late in his life. He still has the New York accent. So uh, Whitman should be regarded as one of the inventors I, I, uh, I, I may uh, name, since he's the inventor of a form of verse that's free from restraints, uh, free to um, embody America's sense of vast possibilities. Uh, in, in actuality, Whitman is not the first person to write in free verse. Those of you who have read William Blake know that he wrote some long poems in uh, unmetered, unmetered poetry. And in the 18th century, some of you may, may, may have run across Christopher Smart, who writes some blank uh, 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 free verse poems based on biblical rhythms. But those two poets uh, were kind of buried in the 19th century and went nowhere. Whitman is the person who introduces free verse to an audience in, in, in a way that's picked up and followed and emulated throughout the rest of uh, uh, subsequent literary history. Um, its freedom uh, is uh, even bragged about in the poem. The poem brags about its lack of restraint from the start. Uh, start. Uh, I'm looking now on page four in stanza one, lines 12 and 13, where he says, I harbor for good or bad. I permit to speak at every hazard, nature without check, with original energy. Uh, you're getting it straight from the source here without any kind of... Uh, uh, repression. And later on on page 4 in line 19, he talks about appear, appearing before you undisguised and naked, again with no restraint. In, uh, on page 4 in uh, section 2 in line 25, uh, he starts to talk about uh, the sound of his belched words. Uh, I'm sorry, it's page uh, 4. Line 25, the sound of the belched words of my voice loose to the eddies of the wind, where he's bragging about the way the poem makes rude noises. Uh, um, on, on page 7 in section 5, lines 84 and 5, loaf with me in the grass, loose the stop from your throat. Uh, he's asking you to do as he does and to free yourself. And at this point, the poem gets dirty. If you, if you follow the next few lines, he asks you to start undressing him. I'm going to get back to this in a minute. Um, on Page 9, in uh, section 8, line 154, in a great verse paragraph, he talks about the, uh, the blab of the pave, uh, the blab that you hear on the pavements. Uh, and then a, a paragraph that goes on to give you the sound, uh, the sound of urban America, the blab of the paves, tires of carts, slough of boot soles, talk of promenaders. Uh, and read through this. You get the sound of uh, New York City. Uh, <clears throat> and finally, on uh, page 17, in stanza 52, line 1330, Two. I too am a, not, not a bit tamed. I too am untranslatable. I sound my barbaric yop over the roofs of the world. So that phrase barbaric yop has been used to characterize Whitman. It goes with the, uh, the rude noise of belched words. And if we put together lines like these, we see the poem is not simply conscious of its uh, unconventional modern poeticism. Uh, it's unpoeticism, uh, it's transgressiveness in voice as well as subject matter, but it exults in it and brags about it, uh, as when Whitman speaks elsewhere in Saga of Myself, of I, Walt Whitman, a cosmos of Manhattan the sun, sensual, fleshy, turbulent, eating, drinking, and breeding. Um, so Walt Whitman is at the center of this poem, which is, after all, called uh, A Song of Myself, the first part of it. Uh, his life spans the years 1809 to 1892, um, which is to say it spanned the uh, 19th century, and it makes Whitman a particularly good touchstone and starting point for this uh, uh, course. Um, um, he grew up in a family of nine kids and was poor, and so he uh, went to school until he was 11 and started to get odd jobs that included, like, setting type for printers and then uh, helping to print and finally writing articles and then newspaper articles and writing. And it wasn't until he was in his 40s that he decided to launch himself as a poet. And what he did was to look around and see little there in the way of poetry, uh, so his whole ambition was to be a, the poet of America, um, uh, the, the first poet to speak for America without deference to the British. Uh, and indeed, uh, he regarded America itself as a great poem. And uh, early, in the, early in the poem, he talks about, um, uh, this is around line 35, uh, stop this day and night with me and you shall possess the origin of all poems. Because he's using the word poem in a very radical sense from the Greek poesis. Uh, um, in turn from the Greek verb poein, which means to create, um, poesis is creation, 
that anything created can be regarded a poem. And in that light, uh, what's the greatest poem of all but America? Something that's been created uh, by the creative spirit of man. Uh, he takes that as a subject. Uh, now, Leaves of Grass was first published in 1855 when Witt was uh, 84, uh, sorry, 44 or 45. And in his lifetime, the book blossomed and went through nine editions. I have here the Library of America edition of Walt Whitman, and uh, I'm going to show you what the 1855 book looked like. This part of the book was what was published in 1855. By the time Whitman died in the 1890s and produced what's called the deathbed edition, it was this size. So it just ballooned in the course of his lifetime. New editions came out uh, after the first publication in 1855 and 1856, 1860, 1861, 1871, and 1891, all of them getting bigger and bigger. And one of the titles of one of the sections, Democratic Vistas, implicitly argues that nothing on the horizon of the American landscape is not fit subject for an American poem. Nothing, because we're all equal and everything in the terrain of poetry is equal. And that's going to get us into two new terrains that you will have not, not have read about in a, a lot of poetry in 45B, uh, which are the topics of sex in the city. Uh, Whitman brings them into poetry. He first of all tells us there's no subject too trivial for poetry. Uh, after all, one of the topics he takes up is a single blade of grass uh, on page four uh, as he starts to contemplate this blade of grass. Um, I'm in line, section one, lines four to five. Uh, I loaf and invite my soul. I lo lean and loaf at my ease, observing a spear of summer grass. Uh, uh, elsewhere, um, leaves stiff and drooping and scabs and weeds on page seven uh, in section five. Uh, the nearest gnat is an explanation, he writes uh, on pages 14 and 15 in section 47. Um, and note where this is going in the direction of like commonness. Uh, it's not to, if, if, if blades of grass and gnats and flies and, and uh, grains of sand can be a topic for poetry, everything is a topic for poetry in common, including the common man. So now recall that uh, the paragraph, verse paragraph I read that begins with uh, Whitman talking about the blab of the pave and all these city sounds and sights. Uh, this is one of the first poems uh, in, in the English language that makes the city the subject of poetry. Think about Wordsworth uh, uh, writing about London and the prelude and, and just despising it and wanting to get away from the city. The city is anti-poetic for the romantics. Uh, but for uh, Whitman in America and across the uh, ocean in France, we have a, a poet named Charles Baudelaire writing a book called Flowers of Evil in which Paris and uh, the urban scene becomes a subject for poetry. Um, uh, the city now becomes a topic for poetry. And uh, notice where uh, uh, things go as uh, uh, we read on page uh, 11. Of the butcher boy putting off his killing clothes or sharpening his knife, blacksmiths with grimed and hairy chests. And in section 13, the negro that drives the long dray of uh, stone yard, uh, uh, of the stone yard, steady and so forth. We're moving in the direction of labor and laborers here. Uh, and further on the poem and other sections of factories and factory production of iron mills. Uh, and then here comes uh, Noah's Ark on page uh, 12. Section 14, where he starts off with the wild gander and then goes off to tell us about the sharp hoofed moose of the north the cat on the house sill, the chickadee, the prairie dog, the brood of the turkey hen. Note these are all American animals, uh, the moose, the turkey, uh, the prairie dog, um, celebrating America. It's kind of Noah's Ark. Um, and then, of course, there's uh, sexuality. His penis becomes a subject of this poem uh, as much as anything else. More about this in a minute. Uh, but he tells us on page 6 in section 3. Um, Welcome is every organ and attribute of me and of any man hearty and clean, not an inch nor a particle of an inch is vile, and none shall be less familiar than the rest, if you know what he means, and I think that you do. Um, <clears throat> so I, I think back to those leaves stiff and drooping, and uh, why does he describe leaves as stiff and drooping? Uh, two interesting adjectives. Uh, uh, sexuality is everywhere in this poem. So Whitman democratizes poetry by championing the freedom or the equality of subject matter. Uh, all things are fit to be made poetic. Um, as he puts it in section 14 on page 12, whatever is commonest, cheapest, nearest uh, uh, is me. Um, uh, actually, take a look at this picture of Whitman, too, the frontispiece, and compare it to pictures you've seen of poets who published prior to him. Shakespeare, for example, and Tennyson, who have like the ruffles around the neck and usually long cloaks to suggest that they're disembodied and don't have bodies. 
uh, Whitman's like in a state of beginning undress. Uh, he's dressed informally, not like Wordsworth in the black uh, evening clothes. Uh, uh, and uh, he, since he invites you to undress him in the poem, I'm, this is a kind of invitation, invitation too, a sign of formality. Uh, and then again, uh, the, uh, the U.S. is uh, treated as the, uh, uh, the greatest poem uh, in Whitman's survey. Uh, its entire terrain becomes a, a kind of free field uh, for the operation of the imagination, for creativity and invention. Uh, again, to go back to that line I recited uh, in part one, uh, nature without check with original energy. Uh, so America is in productive turmoil at the, t at the time that Whitman is writing, in the process of uh, creation, and the world soul is it, it, in, its, in, in its full, hot, bristling activity. Does anybody know how many people lived in San Francisco in 1847? 459. Um, and then, of course, gold was discovered in 1848, and by 1849 there are uh, 25,000 people living in San Francisco. 1,000 people came in every week. Uh, uh, and look at it now. Uh, 18, 18, 1850 is only 150 years ago. Uh, from 259 people to everything you see now. America did that in a very short space of time. Um, the idea of the world soul is a romantic idea, and it, 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 it grows into the poem. It, uh, it's developed in Emerson's essays, where he writes about the oversoul, um, and uh, grows out of German romantic philosophy, and notably Hegel, um, whose uh, phenomenal of spirit talks about the human spirit uh, developing evolutionary in time and getting more and more sharp and taking in more and more, uh, kind of like a, a, an amoeba. Uh, let's recall what uh, ideas of God are in the 19th century. Uh, uh, those of you who taken 45B know that in the 18th century, Deus started to see God not so much in the Bible as in uh, the universe, where Newton started to detect regular laws and patterns, uh, suggesting there was uh, an intelligence uh, behind uh, the operation of things. So God was seen to be imminent in nature, a kind of force in nature, uh, which uh, 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 philosophers started to uh, explore. And then, of course, in the Romantic era, uh, uh, romantics discovered that God manifests itself in the hu human spirit. For William Blake, God only is and acts in other men. So the manifestations of God on earth are seen through the operations of mankind and his collectivity and in the evolutionary for flowing forth of, uh, of na everything that lives is uh, an aspect of God. God is even imminent in a blade of grass for Whitman and in himself. Uh, so if God only acts and is in living men, then uh, divinity manifests itself in the process of being creative, of creating things, of originating. And I'll take you back to that line where Whitman talks about speaking with unchecked, with original energy. You know, prior, prior to the beginning of the 19th century, it would have been blasphemous for anybody to suggest that they were doing anything like creative writing or being original. Uh, Shakespeare wasn't original. He copied stories and sources from other people. Uh, Milton copies the Bible. Uh, to be original or creative uh, would have been blasphemous because only God could create things or originate. But after the development of romantic philosophy with the idea that God acts and, and is in the activities of hu human beings, it becomes possible for humans to be creative and original. So with the romantics, uh, creative writing begins. Uh, and Whitman is writing on the uh, crest of that, that uh, literary movement. Um, so in, in, in a, uh, Hegel's philosophy, the spirit progresses uh, uh, through the world, encountering strange cultures and things it doesn't understand, uh, undergoing clashes and assimilating them like an amoeba and taking them in and moving onward and onward to uh, bigger and better things. Uh, um, <clears throat> in fact, uh, uh, as Emerson writes about the oversoul, the spirit has a kind of manifest destiny to move on and, and uh, conquer what it doesn't know, to conquer the unknown, to subsume it and incorporate it. And so too the poet in whom uh, there is, uh, according to Emerson, a great concentration of soul. And now we can see, begin to see the poem uh, oscillating between two kinds of poles. Uh, it, 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 at one uh, extreme of the pendulum, you start to get these catalogic outpourings of details, uh, turkeys and cats and prairie dogs and uh, uh, particulars and details. Uh, but on the other hand, uh, the sense of a unifying force that uh, brings all these things together in a kind of panoramic, uh, comprehensive view. Uh, the poem keeps on oscillating between myself, uh, uh, I sing myself, uh, I loaf and invite my soul, uh, uh, a very narrow and, and, and egoistical kind of preoccupation. But if you start to ask what's inside that self, it turns out to be like all of the Americas encountered, so that the poem keeps on veering back and forth dialectically with a focus on the I and everything that is not I. Um, 
the poet is like America, uh, destined uh, to take in and absorb more and more experience without being extrained. And, and, and indeed, the, uh, the, the publishing history of the poem suggests that it's evolutionary. It, it started in 1855, and it just kept on ballooning and growing organically. Uh, uh, <clears throat> Women's project was to write up America as a realm of the new, open to imagination, an anvil of creative heat where the mind is free to act on any and all, all raw materials. Let it be. Um, and to transform them. Uh, so given the, modern, uh, the modernity of the poem, the amplitude of its subject matter, America and everything in it, and its philosophy, uh, uh, romantic philosophy, the question uh, remains of what possible verse form or method uh, Whitman could have used to em em embody these aspirations. Uh, what makes this poem poetic? Uh, it's certainly not meter. Um, which is a synonym for measure. Meter, and meter is a, a kind of measure, and as Whitman tells us on page 13, and at the opening lines of 46, I know I have the best of time and space and was never measured and never will be measured. I tramp a perpetual journey. Uh, there's no measure. Uh, instead, we might regard the poem, since it is so evolutionary, as having what Coleridge called organic form. Uh, he distinguished two kinds of poetry in his uh, critical writing, organic form, which just happens like dreams or daydreams uh, um, or uh, reveries. Uh, it just grows out of you. Uh, Keats famously said poetry should come as naturally as naturally as leaves to trees or not at all. Um, and against that mechanical form, which is uh, uh, poetry written by a rule. And Coleridge is, of course, all for the organic form. And since Emerson was one of his, uh, 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 the people he influenced, Emerson believed in organic form too and said, uh, it is not meter, uh, but a meter making argument that makes a poem. A thought so passionate and alive that like the spirit of a plant or an animal, it has an architecture of its own and adorns nature with a new thing. Um, so we're seeing both in uh, Emerson and in Whitman uh, a new architecture, uh, democratic, inclusive, uh, capable of containing any, anything, and also intent on breaking down hierarchy and rules. Aristocracy is a kind of social structure in which uh, some, some people and subjects are superior to others. Um, uh, these kinds of uh, hierarchies have to be thrown off in favor of uh, the democratic um, uh, and similarly, the idea that the poet must take on only lofty uh, lofty subjects uh, Petrarch and love and uh, clouds uh, uh, is lost in this poem where we get lice uh, scabs weeds uh, and whitman 's penis uh, so uh, um, it 's possible to see uh, uh, leaves of Leaves of Grass is a catalogic outpouring of Americana, a kind of cornucopia showing its abundance. Uh, uh, and one way of, of formally regarding Whit Whit this is one way of formally regarding Whitman, but this alone would make a mess of a poem if it was just a long list, a huge catalog. And so you want to see the poem unified by, both by its recurrent reference to romantic philosophy, but also by the sense you get of the my the myself, the personality who's speaking this poem, uh, decidedly American. Um, the personality of the speaker has variously been characterized by critics as uh, heroically self-celebratory, optimistic, full of gusto, verb, likable, likably, uh, politically and sexually aggressive, uh, braving the open uh, and the vast and taking everything all in and making it his own, a kind of representative uh, American. Um, <clears throat> the loosened lines suggest that... Uh, uh, the open spaciousness and vastness uh, of America, uh, and at the same time uh, make us acquainted with this unifi unifying personality, and making the poem, therefore, something like a union of, of uh, different states. Um, I always thought that if you could analogize states to states of mind, that Texas, for example, be a state you wouldn't want to be in. Um, but let's think about all these lines in Whitman and states that are joined together uh, according to the motto, e pluribus unum, out of all these many things, one thing happens. Uh, Leaves of Gra when Leaves of Grass was published in 1855, the Union had 38 states in it. And when Whitman finished publishing the book, it had 44. Uh, so one way of regarding the poem is to see it uh, as uh, the union of all these dif disparate parts and states. And so for a second reason, Whitman becomes representative. Um, Emerson wrote a book called Representative Men, in which he argued that uh, uh, the, world, the, ov the oversoul, the world spirit, manifests itself with a particular intensity in certain people. Uh, uh, who become representative of like the poet or the politician. Napoleon was like the example of the leader for uh, Emerson, Goethe of the poet, uh, but Whitman saw himself as a representative poet speaking for more than himself. Today, today if you think about it, the idea of speaking for all of America, uh, of speaking for Upper East Side Manhattan, for uh, South Central Los Angeles, and for uh, uh, 
uh, Wasili, Wisconsin, uh, Wasili, Alaska, it's impossible. Uh, nobody could possibly do it uh, uh, and represent everybody. But Whitman could do it at the time he wrote because America was coming into its own and it, trying to invent itself and come to terms with the question of what it, is it to be an American um, if not only a dependent and uh, a reject of a, a European parent. Uh, Whitman is struggling to... Uh, um, form uh, American national identity in a way that represents Americans to themselves uh, uh, optimistically and favorably as inventive, energetic, uh, capable of doing everything, of taking this uh, barren continent and turning it into a land of, uh, uh, into, the, into the city on the top of the hill, as the Puritans thought, the, uh, uh, the new heaven and the new earth. Um, today we can realize uh, Whitman's limits. Uh, Langston Hughes famously writes in the 20th century that I too sing America implying that Whitman has left out uh, good percentages of the population he purports to represent in, in this kind of like uh, determination to uh, uh, rush off to the West Coast and absorb as much as he can. There's a kind of imperialist streak in uh, Whitman too, which we can identify with America. But he is speaking America for Americans uh, uh, for at, at a seminal important time in American history. He's great at emphasizing American idioms, uh, earthy and racy and uh, 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 vi vi vitalistic. Uh, if you read these lines out loud, you can start to hear so the voices of soapbox our orators, uh, ranters, uh, sp uh, sprawl plaza types. Uh, uh, take these lines. Uh, I'm on page, uh, it's, it's section 48. I say to mankind, be not curious about God, uh, for I, who am curious about each, am not curious about God. I hear about God in every object, yet understand God not in the least, nor do I understand who there can be more wonderful than myself. Um, uh, you can hear this on Sproul Plaza any day of the, any day of the week. Um, you also hear the voices of philosophers and uh, preachers, uh, newspaper editors. Uh, Whitman was also a fan of Italian opera and of vaudeville and minstrel shows. Uh, so you get in Leaves of Grass something like the voice of the people, vox populi, uh, in, in Thomas Jefferson's phrase, uh, a voice that's speaking for the whole, and not just for the provincial, not just for Long Island uh, uh, or for a particular part of the country, for all of us. Um, so uh, uh, the personality helps to unify the... Uh, uh, the poem, as does a romantic philosophy, um, and so does the poem's uh, focus on creation and, and uh, American creation in particular. We need to recall that uh, America is a land that's founded on biblical principles. The Puritans come over to the Bible and start uh, seeding the East Coast with names like Bethlehem, Pennsylvania, uh, Bethesda, Maryland, uh, and so forth. And on the West Coast, we get uh, Sacramento, the Sacrament, Merced, Mercy, um, San Jose, St. Joseph, uh, San Francisco, St. Francis, and Berkeley. Um, but I mean, the Bible, is the Bible is planted all over the American map. Um, <clears throat> and the poem is taking as its subject creation. So one way of looking at the, the, uh, metri the, uh, the, 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 the prosody, so I, I used this word last time I taught 45C and got an email from a student who asked me about prosody. Um, this is not a word. Uh, Prosody, the study of poetry and meter. Uh, <clears throat> so uh, there's evidence that Whitman studied uh, biblical verse and biblical versification and is using the cadences of the Bible and the leaves of grass. And uh, people who studied uh, Hebrew scripture have pointed out that the Bible uh, is working in a kind of poetry, but it's a poetry that depends on synty syntactic parallelisms. For example, God said, let there be light, and there was light. The woman gave me, and I did eat. My brother Esau is a hairy man, but I am a smooth man. Um, a lot of biblical phrases. Um, um, so the, the, the Bible is important to the foundation of America and again is an epic of creation. And so it's important to the uh, so, a song of uh, myself, uh, the Leaves of Grass, because its subject is uh, biblically derived uh, America. Uh, <clears throat> so look at some of the parallelisms that he's uh, uh, using in, say, page 7, section 5. The last uh, verse paragraph. And I know that the hand of God is the promise of my own. And I know that the Spirit of God is the brother of my own. And that all men ever born are also my brothers. And the women my sisters and lovers. And that a calcium of the creation is love. And limitless are leaves stiffer drooping in the fields. And brown ants. And, and you see the ants at the beginning of the line setting up parallelism. Um, <clears throat> and again in section 13 on page 12. 
Note the way he uses participles, words that end in ing in the first three lines of the page. In me, the caresser of life wherever moving, backward as well as forward slewing. Tunisia's aside and junior bending, not a person or object missing, absorbing all to myself. And then down at the page, the same thing. What is commonest, cheapest is me, me going, adorning myself, not asking, scattering. We get parallels and participles, uh, a biblical co- kind of rhetorical construction. So focusing on uh, parallel lines uh, makes me start to think about the line as the poem's real unit of construction. Um, each one is independent because it doesn't depend on the line that comes before. It doesn't have to rhyme with the line that comes before it or after it. It doesn't have the same number of uh, syllables. So relations of lines to lines are, are color, kind of relative. Um, uh, each is individuated and kind of self-sufficient and self-governing and self-reliant. You could excise a line from Leaves of Grass and still the poem would make sense. Uh, each line is a kind of cornucopia, an abundant uh, uh, outpouring of American diversity, making the poem a kind of finely organized community of lines. Uh, um, there are places in, in Leaves of Grass not anthologized in this book that adopt the modern strategy of commenting on the poem and how the poem is to be read, um, how to view its poetics. Sometimes he analogizes uh, uh, what he's doing to the uh, engineering of a locomotive. Uh, there's a section of Leaves of Grass that's called I Sing the Body Electric, uh, where he sees himself as an electrical technician. Um, leaves the lines of a song uh, of a song of myself are uh, locomotive and power, uh, in part because they they give you what you'd see if you were on a transcontinental train uh, crossing seven or uh, nine or ten states. Um, on page seven, look at section six, um, where he talks about um, grass making uniform hieroglyphic in line 106. Uh, uh, and it sprouts, it sprouts alike in broad zones and narrow zones, growing among black folks as among white. Canuck, Tuckahoe, Congressman, Cuff, I give them the same, I receive them the same. Where the footnotes tell you those four distinctly American names, Canuck, Tuckahoe, Congressman, and Cuff, names four kinds of people. Uh, the sort of diverse population you'd see if you were crossing the continent in a train. What if you cut this poem uh, apart, uh, cut all the lines out singly and put them end to end? Uh, uh, would they form a, a single line uh, long enough to stretch across the continent in a ki- kind of trans- tr- transcontinental train of thought? Uh, 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 this poem is kind of taking you on a transcontinental uh, uh, train of thought. And let's recall also that 19th, the 19th century is a period of history that sees the lineation of America. Um, we see the laying down of lines all over the continent. First of all, rail- railroad lines. Uh, I was trying to recall, is the Southern Pacific to, the, to connect the two tracks in 1865 in Utah with the Golden Spike? I do know that between 1830 and 1865 in England, virtually all the railroad track that's there today got laid down, and the same in America. The land was covered with uh, lines of train tracks, and also with uh, other kinds of lines, property lines, border lines, fences. Uh, we see in a, uh, uh, the Song of Myself and Leaves of Grass a kind of reflection of what's happening to America in the 19th century as it gets lineated and... Uh, turned into a grid. Um, the language, too, expands like the lines, uh, breaking no restraint. Uh, it, too, wants to be free. Uh, so single words are bent in strange new combinations to express new matter. And it's here I want to consider the sexuality of the poem and how often he talks about his penis. Uh, um, what a subject for poetry. What he calls, uh, in the sections of the poem that he can give to you, the hub sting of myself, or this poem drooping, strong and unseen, that I always carry and that all men always carry. Um, and uh, uh, there are other part, part, parts of the poem where he says, I want you to put me in your pocket so that I'm really close to your hips. So I'm going to read you a section of a part of the poem called Calamus. Uh, this is called Whoever You Are Holding Me in Your Hand. Uh, Whoever You Are Holding Me Now in Hand, uh, uh, put your lips upon my lips, I permit you, with the comrade's long dwelling kiss or the new husband's kiss, for I am the new husband and I am the comrade. Or if you will, thrusting me beneath your clothing where I may feel the throbs of your heart arrest upon your hip, carry me when you go forth over land or sea. And he's telling you to kiss the book or put it into your pocket so it's close to your body. Um, well, I'll talk about his relationship to the reader shortly. Um, uh, the reader is part of the poem uh, in ways that... Uh, uh, is true of no other poet. Uh, that, it, you've read the lines that, in which he says, uh, uh, "Undrape, you are not, uh, you are not close to me. I can see through calico or gingham. Um, I can see you naked." Uh, uh, <clears throat> so, uh, it, in section five, uh, on page seven, uh, starting in line eighty-seven, uh, 
I mind how once we lay such a transparent summer morning, how you settled your head athwart my hips and turned over upon me and parted the shirt from my bosom bone and plunged your tongue to my bare stripped heart and reached till you felt my beard and reached till you felt my feet. Um, figure, out what's go figure out what's going on there and write a paper about it for me. <laughs> so um, intercourse means many things, and he really gets inside of you if you let him. Um, so... Uh, Sexuality in the 19th century, uh, if you took 45B, you know that it was a taboo topic. Uh, pianos, uh, uh, pianos in the 19th century had to be covered up with uh, uh, drapes because it, it was thought that seeing legs was obscene. Uh, you couldn't show piano legs to children because it was too suggestive. If you were at a dinner table and wanted a piece of white meat, you had to ask for a piece of chicken bosom because breast was a dirty word, and the word pregnant you didn't use. Um, then a story that cap encapsulates for me uh, the puritanicalness of America in the 19th century is that the uh, English critic Matthew Arnold came over to give a lecture tour, and after he gave a talk in Chicago, one of the ladies' book club members asked him if he wanted a drink, and he said, sure, I'd like some whiskey. So she brought him a bottle and a teaspoon. Um, that was the Victorian era. Um, Whitman doesn't brook any of these restraints. Uh, uh, he's telling uh, his readers that he does not want to cut it off because his lines are long. Um, ladies could not read Whitman in the 19th century, and it's almost certain that Dickinson never read him because he was just advertised as being uncouth and rude, uh, not, uh, uh, not respectable. And the sexuality of the poem, it, it's everywhere, and it's fascinating, and it raises all kinds of questions. Uh, one of my favorite sections is number 11 on pages 10 to 11, uh, which is basically an account of a, 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 a spinster, an unmarried woman, staring out of her window at 28 men who are bathing on the seashore. Um, um, the young men flutter their backs while their welt, white bellies bulge to the sun. Um, they do not ask who seizes fast to them. They do not know who puffs and declines with pendant and bending arch. They do not think whom they south with spray. It's an odd poem because the point of view is of a female looking at these uh, undraped male bodies and admiring their sexuality. So it seems, it seems like a heterosexual moment, but it, you have to remind yourself that the writer is a male who's writing about what it's like to be a female desiring a male. And uh, 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 where else have, do you see the word bulge uh, in Souse with Spray? Um, so, and then, uh, it, it, this, is, this is followed by a section I read to you, a section about labor in America we, where we see the butcher boy putting off his killing clothes, uh, and um, blacksmith with grimed and hairy chests, um, and the, sh the, the light shear of their waists and their massive arms. It's just like a beefcake, a beefcake cavalcade in here, is, is it not? Uh, yeah, the butcher boy takes off his clothes and pulls out his tool. Um, <clears throat> so uh, to, uh, to be fair to Whitman, uh, there, there's just as much a description of female sexuality in this poem, too. On page 16 in section 49, you've got an account of a a couture or a midwife delivering a birth, and Whitman is exploring the way the baby comes out of the ex exquisite, flexible doors of the female genitalia. So these passages raise the, have raised the question for readers of uh, Whitman's sexuality. Um, is, was he hom homosexual or, or bisexual? Uh, somebody asked him this question in the middle of his career, and uh, it, it kind of shocked him, and then he started talking about how he had spawned like 10 or 12 illegitimate children and was really like... Um, uh, it was going around the in, the, in the, the words of the poem, uh, he, was, he went around the country jetting the stuff of new republics. Um, uh, but some suspicion is that he made up these stories about having illegitimate kids to uh, act as a kind of disguise for the fact that he may have been gay. Um, you would not believe some of the stuff that is in this book. Uh, uh, this is the female form. He goes on to describe like the conception of a child. Um, Love flesh swelling and deliciously aching, limitless limpid jets of love hot and enormous, quivering jelly of love, white blow and delirious juice, bridegroom night of love working surely and softly in the prostrate dawn, and I'm embarrassed to go on. Uh, <laughs> uh, I, I, I urge you to explore this book. Uh, so uh, uh, women's sexuality, I, I like the idea that uh, America is a place that's polymorphously perverse. Uh, we're free to do anything. Uh, we're free to connect anything with anybody, anytime we want. Anything goes here. Uh, we're the country of freedom. Lots of energy and productivity and room for invention, too. Uh, to be fair to Whitman, uh, uh, 
there, uh, in the 19th century, it was like just a matter of course that if you went to visit somebody, you would stay in the bed with a, a member of the same sex. That, uh, furniture was expensive. It was common for guys to sleep together when they visited for women, too. Uh, and it may have been common for like guys to uh, get, get frisky. Uh, because, as you know, if you've read the work of Michel Foucault, uh, either in The Birth of the Clinic or in uh, The History of Sexuality, there seems not to have been anything, any such thing as a homosexual until the late 19th century, when with the rise of medical professions and psychiatrists, people started classifying other people as this kind of neurotic or that kind of neurotic. Uh, there's no doubt that uh, homosexual acts existed before the, late, the 1880s, but they weren't labeled that way. Um, people didn't think about it. So uh, Whitman uh, probably had a, a, a pretty liberal uh, s sexual life, uh, but he never uh, uh, admitted to being homosexual or gay and uh, kind of hid it um, and left us guessing. It might have been he was smart uh, not to want to get boxed into a hole, but to represent the kind of freedom of everybody to be the kind of person they want to be. Even so, the erotic glow that you get in this poem, um, the, the loss, it's an essential part of it. Uh, Whitman is enthralled by sexuality, and I think uh, what you see him doing is rejecting normal, uh, conventionalized eros for a fitter one, not bound by uh, monogamy, exclusively uh, 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 an exclusively procreative focus, uh, uh, or sexuality as a form of sublimated, sublimated work. The sexuality in this work is creative, uh, original, and uh, free associated, uh, free associative. Uh, and that l lends another dialectic to this amazingly contradictory poem. On the one hand, it seems at some moments narcissistic. He's talking about like his genitalia and his sex, and it's a song of myself, after all. But on the other hand, it's a song that celebrates everything he's come into contact with that's excited him and um, uh, filled him with erotic desire. And it's not just uh, other human bodies, but the whole prospect of adventure in America. And you're implicated, too, in this. Uh, yeah, the personality of Whitman emerges from all the effects I've been talking about, uh, uh, the, the poem's vast descriptive panorama, its, uh, its philosophical grounding, um, its novel lineation, its vocabulary, its sexuality, its biblicism. What, what comes out of all of this is uh, uh, the sense of uh, an, an American adventurer, somebody who's lusting and lusting and eager to uh, move on in life, a social radical, um, egalitarian, and abolitionist. Um, we have two sections, one on page 10, section 10, in which we get an account of uh, the speaker taking in a runaway slave, uh, reminding us, too, of the, uh, uh, the dating of the poem. And then section... 13 on page 11 talks about the uh, uh, the Negro worker, uh, the, the uh, dray, uh, dray driver, uh, talking about the free man. Whitman's politics on the subject of slavery are unclear. I, I don't think he was ever like a full-blown abolitionist, but he was a free stater and opposed the expansion of slavery into uh, other uh, other uh, into new states. Uh, and of course, he was a, a ferocious uh, a supporter of the Union and of Abraham Lincoln uh, during the Civil War and worked as a male nurse. Uh, for a reason you can think about. Uh, uh, I patriotism, and uh, he's a complex guy. Uh, <laughs> uh, so he comes across as uh, sexually radical, egalitarian, uh, enthusiastic about the future, uh, unconquered, uh, always seeing something delicious and exciting on the uh, horizon. Uh, let me turn that into poetry. I can, I can, I can bring it into these, these states I put together and make it mine. Uh, the speaker seems open-minded and good-willed and practical and full of youthful vitality. Um, um, close, to the, close to natural impulse. I, I'm speaking uh, without restraint, unchecked. Uh, and that's to say uh, not putting any kind of restraints on sexuality as well. And so the effect of all this is a, a powerful uh, voice, uh, close to the natural, um, striving to take on more and more. Uh, the poem thematizes and formalizes, formalizes and celebrates this kind of power, uh, the power of line nine, uh, 13, nature without check, with original energy, um, um, innocent and uh, constantly productive. Uh, dur during the, the middle of the uh, uh, evolution of Leaves of Grass, there's a famous uh, painting by a guy named Frederick Church. I just discovered there's a data projector here, so maybe I'll be able to do some projections. It's a painting of Niagara Falls. It's just, uh, it's just like water pouring over a cliff without stopping. It just keeps on going. And it was, uh, the painting was viewed by 100,000 people in the first month of its exhibition. It's kind of like an artistic equivalent to Leaves of Grass. We keep on pouring it out and pouring it on and uh, producing power and inventions. Um, uh, so the poem is full of ciphers for inventions and machines, uh, signs of the imagination trying o triumphing over raw materials and multiplying its power and affecting uh, earth-shaking metamorphoses, uh, creating poetry out of dross, uh, and using technology uh, uh, to shape uh, the world of raw nature. 
Um, I called attention last time to the way poets are in competition with scientists in the middle of the 19th century. Uh, 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 science is doing so much to improve human life that uh, artists start to feel threatened, and therefore they get interested in technical effects too, and an invention of the sort we saw in, uh, we see in Whitman, uh, the poet is in competition. Um, so Whitman applies technology to the raw materials of the senses, uh, eroticizes them, and uh, gives us this poem. And uh, as part of the poem's democratic vistas of making nothing not a subject for poetry, it's important to note that you're part of it too. Um, there are two sections of Leaves of Grass. One is called uh, Sons of Adam, which is kind of heterosexual. The other is called Calamus, uh, um, which is about friendship or, or a, a, a love among men. Um, there's room in this poem for everybody. And there are a lot of passages like the one I read you where uh, Whitman invites you to... Uh, 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 take him in your hand and kiss him and put him in your clothes and uh, walk around with him. Um, he makes you a part of the poem and asks you to reflect upon your investment in this. He also leaves you with a lesson uh, when he tells you uh, uh, where he leads you in, on page 13 in section 46. Um, I have no chair, no church, no philosophy. I lead no man to a dinner table, library exchange, but each man and each woman of you I lead upon a knoll my left hand hooking you round the waist, my right hand pointing to landscapes of continents in the public road. Not I, nor anyone else can travel that road for you. You must travel it for yourself. So that the poem ends up telling you, as somebody he's taken into his embrace and confidence, that you have to be like him by not being like him. Uh, you have to be yourself, uh, be unique and individual, and sing the song of your own self. So let me just uh, close by saying that uh, 20th century uh, poetry is heavily influenced by Whitman, and we're going to see his effects and his voice re-emerging in uh, the poetry of T.S. Eliot and Ezra Pound. Uh, uh, those of you who have the Norton Anthology of Modern Poetry want to go uh, ahead in the volume and explore uh, Pound's cantos. William Carlos Williams wrote a long epic poem called Patterson about Patterson, New Jersey. We've got a poem in this anthology by an English poet, David Jones, called the Anathemata, um, which is taken after Whitman. And Hart Crane's famous uh, epic poem, The Bridge, is very much in competition with uh, Whitman. And there are more. Uh, it's just that he leaves an indelible, uh, indelible print on the subsequent shape of American literature. <laughs>